Thank you very much, Eva, for that introduction, and fabulous to be on this panel with such an esteemed group of, uh, of city leaders and researchers alongside Magnus and Eric, so thank you all for being here. Um, I'll pick up exactly where Magnus left off, um, really to emphasise the unique set of circumstances that the conflagration of extremism, weaponized hate, disinformation, and the COVID-19 pandemic bring together to create considerable vulnerabilities within communities around the world um, and uh, the opportunity for extremist ideologies to have even more purchase um, among such communities. We heard from Magnus about this perfect storm um, and I think it's worth just reminding ourselves as we're almost a year on now about the sort of shock and trauma that this uh, pandemic has, has wrought on communities you know universally around the world. In less than a year the COVID-19 crisis has fundamentally altered geopolitics, socioeconomic landscapes, uh, conflicts around the world. Um, and all of these, of course, have huge impacts on terrorism and extremism. Um, and the long-term impacts of all of these are only starting to become evident now. Um, and undoubtedly, they will be uh, long-term issues. This isn't going to go away uh, with the uh, rollout of a vaccine. Unfortunately, this has seeded the ground for long-term discord and polarization. And when you look at the data from uh, the latest year and the Global Terrorism Index that came out um, several months ago, you see that uh, we've seen perhaps an, a slight decline overall internationally in terrorist violence. Um, you know, this is perhaps not to be um, uh, unexpected, given the fact that societies have ground to a halt. Um, this has largely affected urban settings where we've seen less violence, but of course, in recent months with uh, the attacks in, in Paris and, and in Austria, we've seen the potential, um, and of course, the, the terrible bombing in Baghdad today, the potential sort of regrowth of, of the sort of uh, patter of violence that we've seen um, taking place prior to the COVID pandemic. But with the global lockdowns, we've seen an enormous spike in um, the targeting of propaganda, as Magnus said, from a range of different uh, extremist actors and state and non-state uh, forces seeking to use this to peddle authoritarian uh, solutions to the virus. Um, I, I've been asked to speak a little bit about the sort of Islamist extremist landscape. Um, so I will sort of do a bit of an international survey of what we've seen. Um, the first thing to say is that COVID-19, of course, has exacerbated many harmful phenomena that we've seen globally from wage stagnation through to uh, income inequality. And similarly, it's, um, it's exacerbated trends that we've seen uh, in terrorism and extremism as well. So, for example, the, uh, the, the, the terrifying rise in violence in sub-Saharan Africa, um, which was a concern in 2019, has only increased during the pandemic um, and has now become a major uh, battleground for international Salafi jihadist extremism with areas like uh, Mozambique and other areas of Southeast Africa, but also the Lake Chad Basin, um, you know, seeing a huge resurgence of, of violence um, from both Al Qaeda and ISIS affiliated groupings there. Um, you know, concerningly, we've also seen an enormous rise, as Magnus said, of political violence and of uh, far right extremism uh, in Western countries. Obviously, this trend really spiked um, from March 2019 with the Christchurch attack, which saw the death of over 50 Muslims attacked in there uh, at prayer in a mosque in, in New Zealand, but has, has you know, continued at pace with attacks in Hanau and, and Halle and others and you know, many cities that we have represented on this call are on the receiving end of this, uh, of, of this terrifying um, trajectory of violence, which of course you know, has seen its ultimate manifestation in the events at the US Capitol on uh, January the 6th as well, with the takeover of one of the great symbols of democracy in Western countries. So, uh, you know, it's, it's hugely part of this overall wave that we're seeing and very intimately related to trends in, um, in the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, extremists, by definition, seize on crisis opportunities. Um, and really, if, if you look at a definition of extremism, you see the fundamental tension between an in-group and an out-group at the heart of this. And the out-groups that Magnus referred to uh, you know, minority communities, for example, um, are increasingly being demonized and um, vilified by extremist ideologies that are blaming them for the virus, whether it's uh, for the initial spread of the virus or whether it's for, um, you know, sort of being part of uh, uh, some sort of conspiracy that is at its source. There are all kinds of, um, of ways that extremist ideologies are using this in-group, out-group dynamic um, that COVID has only served to exacerbate. Um, and within Islamist extremists, we've seen a number of narratives emerging, and we, we heard Magnus refer to a few of them there. But I just want to touch on, on some specific groups and how they've responded. Um, 
in the Middle East, for example, in Syria, we've seen the uh, Syrian jihadist group Hayat Tahrir al-Sham uh, present COVID-19 as a sort of apocalyptic um, harbinger, which is bringing about political and economic collapse and a real geopolitical opportunity for such jihadist groups to seize on this agenda. Um, ISIS have referred to the, um, uh, the, the virus as a soldier of Allah for uh, doing the work of God, whilst the Taliban has claimed that it was sent by God, the virus, in response to disobedience and the sins of mankind. Um, others have used conspiratorial language around this being a Zionist uh, 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 biological terror attack, um, or indeed sort of blaming crusader forces in the case of Al-Shabaab in East Africa um, uh, as being responsible for the, for the spread of the virus. But also we've seen elements of a state building, optimistic utopian dynamic being used by jihadist groups as well. They're using this as a means of uh, emphasizing the efficacy of an Islamic response to the virus um, and really emphasizing in their propaganda, um, the healthcare systems of the so-called caliphate or the emirate in, um, uh, in North Africa or in, in Syria. Um, and I think it's always worth remembering that this isn't just about destruction and violence, but actually these extremist groups are offering a positive alternative. And that's no different in the case of COVID where governments have really struggled with their implementation and extremist groups are there ready to sort of fill this void. Um, and this is something that the United Nations Counterterrorism Executive Director has pointed to as terrorist groups present themselves as alternative service providers. It's important to bear that in mind. In the online space, we've also seen a number of new tactics being used by extremist groups to uh, radicalize and recruit. Um, I, ISD research looked at a pro-ISIS network um, over three months, uh, fairly early on in the pandemic, um, of several hundred accounts on Facebook, um, which was exhibiting a number of new techniques that it was experimenting to get round moderation techniques by the platform. Um, we saw a number of different evasion tactics being used, um, including um, uh, coordinated raids on attacks to, uh, to sort of emphasize and amplify their propaganda. Uh, to mask their content behind news provider content such as the BBC or Al Jazeera or France 24, uh, to hijack um, hashtags associated with the coronavirus. Obviously, there's a huge amount of online discussion around this, and they are keen to latch on to the coattails of this to, uh, to sort of really get their voice heard within the conversation. And we've seen networks like this able to persevere online and to sort of survive moderation efforts. And it really shows you that whilst there are a number of smaller platforms that are providing uh, a safe space for extremists to mobilize, also on the mainstream platforms, as their ability to respond is diminished with many moderators, uh, the major tech companies, um, either you know, working from home or, um, or themselves suffering from the virus. It really does show you that there are sort of weak points in, in how we deal with explicit terrorist content online. Whilst Magnus has already talked about the far right, you know, we've seen a similar trend that, that's happened here, not least the, the range of digital platforms that they've sought to mobilize on. We've seen image board sites like 8chan and 4chan, um, censorship free platforms like Vote, what pre was previously Parler, which was recently uh, taken down by Amazon Web Services, um, and increasingly encrypted messaging channels like Telegram, um, really being used by extremists to coordinate campaigns and which have really proliferated during the pandemic. It's also been, Magnus mentioned the gamification. I think this is really worth emphasizing. In the US in particular, our analysis has shown propaganda trying to gamify violent extremism, talking about how players can achieve points by carrying out attacks against law enforcement, against Muslims, Jews, police, um, and really sort of using this moment to, to sort of emphasize the, the competitive nature of, of this sort of violent extremism online. Now, uh, we, we heard about other new and emerging phenomena like QAnon, and I think it, it's worth emphasizing the increasing diversification of the extremism threat that we've seen during COVID. We're moving really from a sort of fairly monochromatic challenge, uh, a fairly black and white challenge from violent extremism that might have been represented by formal extremist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda towards a, a real technicolor, a sort of kaleidoscope of new threats uh, from white supremacists, from neo-Nazis, from violent incel movements, and, and you know, the, the borderline of conspiracy and extremism represented by groups like QAnon. Um, so this is really going to prove a major challenge for policymaking at both a national and a local level, understanding this increasingly gray area between these sort of online harms and how they relate to genuine offline challenges, um, including violence, including polarization and hate crime, um, things like anti-Semitism, as we see a huge rise in anti-elite sentiment, you know, a belief that elites are holding back vaccines, that elites are 
uh, social engineering, we're only going to see these kind of sentiments increase. Um, and there's a lot of scope online for discussing this. So, you know, th this is really the point that I'd end on here is, is thinking about this challenge of violent extremism solely in terms of terrorist organizations isn't really up to scratch anymore in this sort of post COVID-19 world. We need to think of a much broader frame here um, around the sort of rapidly changing organizing principles and, and manifestations of, of violent extremism, looking at wider ecosystems that exist beyond just specific groups um, and the sort of subcultures from which these threats are increasingly emanating. And just to, to, find, to, to finish off on, whilst signs may be optimistic and I don't want to sort of put a bit of a downer on the conversation with you know many things to, to look forward to and look up at for the months ahead, history warns us that this combination of economic calamity, societal polarization, geopolitical uncertainty provide really rich opportunities for violent extremists to pose supremacist solutions. Um, and this has, of course, profound implications for public safety and social cohesion. So we just need to really think about this really fragmented global extremist landscape that we're seeing and, uh, and, and really be cognizant of the long term impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on these issues. Um, so I'll leave it there and, and pass over to, to Eric, for, perhaps for a more sort of practitioner focused view on, on what we've been seeing on, at the juncture of COVID and extremism.